Hi, everyone. Just letting you know that we're about ready to get started. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fern Frusty, and I am the ERIC Collection Development Lead. I would like to begin first by thanking you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today to talk about the proposed updates to the ERIC peer review policy. As we begin, I'd like to first take care of a few housekeeping items. We will be muting everyone so we do not get feedback from your phones, but we do want your participation today. We are very interested in receiving your comments and questions that may come to mind during the presentation. To submit them to us, please type in the chat text box in the right-hand column at any time. If the text box is not open on your screen, click the chat icon located in the upper right portion of your screen to open it. Be sure to send your chat message to all panelists, which is the default in the chat panel. We'll be monitoring your input throughout the webinar and we'll respond to as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Also, we will be putting up a few polling questions during the webinar, primarily to gain an understanding of our audience and your thoughts about the topics under discussion. So to begin, you should be seeing a polling question in the right-hand column, along with some optional responses. At any time, you can start answering the polling question. Um, if any of you do not see the poll, would you please send a message through our chat feature and our technical support representative will help you. Responding to these questions is completely voluntary. You are not required to uh, submit an answer, but if you do wish to respond, please select the answer and then click the submit button that's located at the bottom of the polling screen. It's very important that you click submit or we will not receive your answer. The polls are timed to remain active for one minute, so please enter and submit your responses shortly after each polling screen appears. Lastly, we are recording the session, and a few weeks after the town hall, we will post it as a video on YouTube. We will also post the slides on the ERIC multimedia page and send everyone who registered an email letting them know that the slides and the video are available. Okay, I'm just checking the polling results, and the time limit is up, and it looks like um, we are primarily a group of librarians with some researchers and a few others that have marked other. Thank you very much for participating. Erin Pollard, the project officer for ERIC, will be speaking with you shortly. I'm going to begin with reviewing today's agenda and sharing some background information. Okay, now you should be seeing another polling question. Uh, before we review the, today's agenda, we'd like to invite you to answer the polling question about the version of ERIC that you use. Do you use the free version provided at eric.ed.gov or a vendor-provided version? While both versions contain the same records, there are some differences, and so knowing this background will help us to provide the best answers to your questions. Okay, and we are getting the responses in. It looks like um, we are primarily using the vendor-supplied version. Again, thank you for very, very much for um, responding to the polling question. Our meeting today will begin with some background information about the ERIC peer review policy. We'll talk about why we're considering a change at this time, review the proposed policy, and discuss the impact of the change. Then we will share a summary of the feedback that we've received from users since June and open the floor for your comments and questions. Just a reminder, we'll be monitoring the chat feature throughout the presentation. You can submit your comments at any time and then we will review them and discuss them during the uh, question and answer time. The peer review policy is one selection criteria of the ERIC selection policy. The selection policy states broad collection goals and defines the standards and criteria required for a journal or a center, agency, or individual materials to be indexed in the ERIC digital library. The current peer review policy states which content can be flagged as peer reviewed and how this status is determined. 
You can find the complete selection policy by using the selection policy link at the bottom of any ERIC website page, and then click the PDF link to view or download the document. Since ERIC was founded over 50 years ago, it has been unique in that it indexes both journal articles and gray literature such as government documents, conference papers, and reports. ERIC began adding the peer review indicator to new journal article records and work published by the Institute of Education Sciences in 2004. In 2012, ERIC updated the peer review indicator on journal records published since 1966. In 2013, we started adding this indicator for grantee-funded journal manuscripts. Over the years, we've made these enhancements to indicate to users what content has gone through a peer review process. We are proposing to further extend this flag to gray literature sources with a proven peer review process. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Aaron Pollard to talk about why we're considering the change to the policy and what it will mean to users. Thanks, Fern. So to begin, why are we proposing this change? Let's begin about talking about where we are today. As Fern describes, ERIC currently extends the peer review flag to some types of records and not others. This is creating user confusion. We want to provide the most complete and accurate information possible, so we looked at ways to clarify this. As Fern mentioned, the publications that IES funds under contract such as the condition of education and reports from the What Works Clearinghouse and the regional educational laboratories are peer reviewed through a process managed by IES and then IES publishes the product. These documents go through a rigorous peer review process as required under law and are marked as peer reviewed in our collection. Many of these publications go through multiple rounds of peer review. For example, reports published by the Regional Educational Laboratory Program or RHEL reports have the initial proposal for each study peer reviewed. Then the authors will work with a technical working group of experts in the field as they conduct the study and develop the report. Finally, the final report goes through a rigorous peer review process with multiple reviewers. Similarly, evaluation reports also go through a rigorous process. The authors will work with a technical working group as the study is being conducted, and then the final reports will go through a double-blind double peer review process with multiple reviewers. Additionally, all peer-reviewed work that IES funds in her grant is required to be submitted to ERIC. This material is marked as peer-reviewed. The majority of these documents are final peer-reviewed manuscripts of journal, journal articles, so these publications actually go through two layers of peer review. The first is a peer review of the grant application. This is conducted by IES through the same office that coordinates peer review for contract-funded evaluations. The second layer of review happens for the article. This is conducted by the journal according to the journal procedures. However, there are also a handful of other publications marked as peer-reviewed but are not grantee submissions. These are reports that are funded under IES contract and were peer-reviewed as was required by law. However, for a variety of reasons, they were not published by IES. They are high-quality work and work that is of interest to our users. ERIC has marked these documents as peer-reviewed as required by our legislative mandate. While there are only a handful of records like this, we expect more in the future, and they do cause confusion. We wanted to update the selection policy to reflect why these records contain the peer review flag. Additionally, we know that there is work published in non-journal sources outside of IES that is also peer-reviewed. For example, we've seen conference papers like this one published by the Australian Teacher Education Association. On the front page of the document, it states that the abstract and full paper are blind peer reviewed. We think that it is confusing to have a paper like this that clearly identifies itself as peer reviewed but did not receive the peer review flag. Finally, when we look to add new sources to our collection, we have preference to sources that publish peer reviewed content because we believe that users find great value in these materials. By extending our definition of peer review, we, want, we will be able to expand this priority to the highest quality gray literature material that our users most want to use. Our proposed change would clarify some processes that we already have in place. It would add a definition of what peer review processes ERIC accepts for the indicator on ERIC records, so users would have a clear expectation of the types of materials that they are receiving. ERIC would, would recognize two types of peer review. Blind peer review and expert peer review. 
We feel like they both have an important place in the review process and would be happy to discuss why in the Q&A session. We also want to expand this indicator to other approved gray literature sources that have a peer review process. To be clear, we aren't extending this flag to all gray literature sources, just those with a peer review process that meets our criteria. The proposed language makes clear how we would assign peer review record to records. For journals, we would continue to assign peer review at the journal level and apply the flag to all the records created for the source. For non-journal materials, we would either assign peer review for all records or for a specific series, such as conference papers. For content submitted through the online submission system, the policy ex explains the current policy, which allows peer-reviewed grantee content to be flagged as peer-reviewed. Instead, we propose expanding the policy to all submitted work if the person submitting the content can demonstrate that their manuscript has been peer reviewed. This indicator would only be added if the individual submits a URL to the publisher's page outlining the peer review process. To learn more and to read the full proposed policy, please go to the ERIC homepage and click Learn More. To give a sense of scale, what will be the impact of these changes? We forecast that initially we may be able to add the peer review indicator to approximately 100 gray literature records per year. The majority of these will be conference papers and government funded reports. As our process of identifying sources that produce peer review content matures, we expect this, this number to grow. We expect this new policy to have a broader implication. Eric will continue to build upon its tradition of high quality gray literature and elevate the status of gray literature in the field. During a review cycle, if we find that a gray literature source has a peer review process, they would receive the same collection priority as peer review journals. So now that we've reviewed the proposed changes, we want to stop for a minute to see what you think. As of today, are you in favor of the change or are you opposed? We'll let you know the results in just a minute. Okay, and as a reminder, we, well, we still have time to submit results. Please make sure you hit the submit button to lock in your answer. We're not going to be able to move on the screen until people hit the submit button. Okay. So as we're waiting for the last couple of results to trickle in, it looks like right now we have about half of our users are in favor of the proposed change. And then about a third are not sure. Then there's a strong 10% that are not in favor. And we really look forward to hearing your reasons why. So what we're going to do next is that we're going to share some of the input we received for, from our call to feedback that went out in early June as a way of framing a robust discussion. So we put a broad call out for feedback in June. In addition, I presented on the proposed changes at the Special Libraries Association, also known as SLA, and the American Library Association, or ALA, annual meetings this summer. The responses that we have received have been overwhelmingly positive. One aspect to note is that we had a diverse group of respondents giving feedback, including education researchers, professors, academic and other librarians. However, we didn't hear from a very large number of day-to-day -day users, only 20 set, uh, or of individual or of users in general. We only heard from 27 individuals in total, and none of those users were students or day-to-day -day ERIC users. So we cannot assume that the feedback we heard was representative of everyone's concern. We'd like to receive, review the feedback that we have received and then hear from you today. So to begin, most of the comments submitted to us since June have welcomed the change, and the quotes you see here are fairly representative of what the majority of input said. The first two comments indicate that this is, quote, a welcome policy shift and, quote, a much needed change that is long overdue. The third comment provides a specific example of how the policy change will be helpful, citing conference papers as a category of materials that are difficult to assess in terms of quality. This user believes that, peer review, that the peer review flag will be helpful and useful in helping them identify high quality conference papers. Similar to the last comment, here's another comment that we've received 
also citing the importance of high-quality conference papers to research. This says, quote, most definitely revise the error peer review policy. It is very beneficial to my research. Peer review conference papers, especially those from the American Education Research Association, are very important to the fields of inquiry that change quickly. My current example is state accountability for schools. State accountability is changing so quickly that I need the most current research available. It's like it's often found in conference papers. Professional associations like AERA use a rigorous peer review system. Such literature should be considered peer review, end quote. However, when, however, not everyone has the same feelings. In the next comment, which says, quote, I've seen conference papers that are, depending on the conference, that are very poorly done, end quote. Comments such as this raise concerns about the quality of some conference papers. So this leads us to our next question. Um, and this states, would it be helpful to know if a conference paper has been peer reviewed? We're going to check, we want to know if you agree with this and if you think it's helpful for these to be peer reviewed. And we're going to share the results with you momentarily. Okay, it looks like we've heard back from a number of people. Um, and right now, 88% of the people say yes, it would be helpful. So this is something good to know that people do think that conference, knowing if conference papers are peer reviewed will be helpful. Um, to answer a question that came in during the poll, they asked, do we do any presentations or give feedback from AERA? Um, we did not. Um, simply because um, the ERIC team did not attend AERA this year. How we, however, we have reached out to the education community um, and education research community in a variety of ways um, and have been in touch with AERA directly uh, about this proposed change, but that was with AERA um, staff as opposed to a presentation at the annual conference. Okay, so to move on. Another comment brought up the issue that this would challenge current perceptions about the peer review process for grade literature, and that it is not as rigorous for journals. This comment says, quote, whenever I talk to a class about doing research at my university, I always include a discussion about the peer review process and try to include the professor in these discussions. Every time the professor, no matter which professor it is, describes grade literature as not being, they describe the peer, they describe gray literature as not being peer reviewed. I noticed that AP's database of gray literature, Psych Extra, removes peer, the peer reviewed only option when searching the database. I believe that many gray literature publications are rigorously peer reviewed, so I'm ultimately in favor of your proposed change, but I do think that it will challenge some researchers' perceptions of what is peer reviewed. Perhaps this is a good thing." End quote. So this leads us to our next question. And this says, do you believe the peer review process is different for gray literature than it is for journals? So while you're voting, we've heard this feedback a lot through our various audiences, and especially for IES published reports. In our experience, the quality of peer review processes for journals varies quite a bit, as does the quality of the peer review process for non-journals. After we get the results from the poll, we'll discuss this more. Okay, it looks like we have a different poll question up than what is on the slide. So what we're gonna do is we are going to open up a new poll. So let's close this one. If you haven't hit submit, please hit submit so we can move on. Okay, so we're just waiting for the last person to hit submit, and then we're going to move on to the correct poll. Sorry about this. Okay, so here's the poll. Do you believe the peer review process is different for gray literature than it is for journals?
And as these responses are coming in, we're starting to see some really good questions and comments coming in um, from users. And please continue to submit them. We're going to just go through a couple other things, and then we're going to open up a discussion. But we think that the questions that we've gotten so far, um, hopefully we'll start a really good discussion. Okay, so it looks like everyone has finished voting. And our responses are interesting. One third of users say that they do believe the process is different, but about two thirds of users are unsure. So we'll get more into this in a minute. Um, so we've received comments challenging whether gray literature is important enough or can really be considered high quality enough to warrant peer review status. And this comment struck us. It says, quote, why would I care if an organization's internal report is peer reviewed? It seems as if Eric wants to promote a subset of this literature as being more valuable. The notion is laudable, but using peer review as the criterion seems dubious. End quote. There also seems to be some concern that Eric might flag materials based off of type, such as conference reports, conference papers, reports, etc., rather than on evidence of the peer review process. That's not what we're proposing to do. The publisher must provide an adequate evidence before the indicator will be added to the record. We have also received suggestions for, challenge, for changing the online submission system. And the comment we received was, quote, we may want to change the policy to be that authors must revise their work based on peer review. Otherwise, that is a low bar and we may get a lot of schlock. Why are we treating the grantees and contractors differently than the public in this online submission system, end quote. So the first part of this comment refers to making authors revise their work based off of comments from peer review. While this sounds like a good idea, there's no way for Eric to ensure this. Eric is not conducting the peer review process. Additionally, it is possible that an author has an outstanding first draft and that it needs no edits. This would be amazing and something that I've never seen with working with IES publications or in publishing journals, but it is theoretically possible. Secondly, and asks why do we treat contractors and grantees differently? with the assumption that we are treating them easier than we are treating the general public. Um, the reason for this is that contractors are going through an IES managed review process. We are aware that they are meeting a standard considerably higher than the bar set for other non-journal sources. And by putting in their contract number in the online submission system, we can verify the peer review process that that article or report went through, and that they are meeting the letter of law that their work is peer reviewed. For most of the contract-funded work submitted through the online submission systems, contractors are required to submit their acceptance to ERIC and an outline of the peer review process as a condition of payment for their work. This verification happens, but it's behind the scenes. It happens down the hall outside of ERIC. For grantees, the system is also different because it, they work closely with us, and our legislation requires them to submit peer-reviewed work to ERIC. When they submit their work to ERIC, they use a grant number to verify that their work was peer reviewed as is required under law. Then, similarly under contracts, we verify the peer review process on the back end outside of the work of ERIC. Our grantees have to submit their ERIC IDs to their grant officers as part of their annual assessment. So now we're going to move on to the next question. And this should be, um, should reports from organizations that have a peer review process be flagged as peer reviewed? And this gets into the issue of rigor and fairness. We at ERIC may not be familiar with the quality of peer review processes at that organization. However, it's important to note that ERIC doesn't evaluate how rigorous journal peer review processes are. This is the same kind of policy. So we're gonna, we've opened up polling here, and if you just want to take a second to vote on that. Okay. So this is the poll that you might have seen earlier, and so I think many of you may have voted earlier in this one, and in that case, we had a mixed bag of results. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna close the poll, and we're gonna move on to the next question. Okay, so I know that some of you not only use ERIC, but also teach it to others. And we've received some feedback related to the student use of ERIC that we'd like to share. Most of this input was not that the gray literature content shouldn't be tagged as peer reviewed. Rather, there are concerns 
that users who would want to find only peer-reviewed journal articles would have to know that they are filtered that their filter peer-reviewed only search will also include gray literature. This has been the largest source of concern and something that has frequently suggested as a way of Eric having a peer-reviewed, this has been the largest area of concern. Something that has frequently been suggested is to have a way to search for only peer-reviewed journals. This option is currently available in Eric by selecting peer-reviewed and then selecting journal articles as a publication type and we are exploring an easier way to do this, but there are a lot of issues that come up. For example, is, is a final peer-reviewed manuscript a journal article? It may be verbatim the same text, but it's not a journal article. So this leads us to poll seven, which should be open on your screen now. Do you believe that this change will lead to user confusion, especially among students? It's important to know a few things as you answer. We, as IES and ERIC, have to make sure that information is broadly available. It isn't our role to create requirements that students must use peer-reviewed journal articles or to have an opinion on that requirement. So while we recognize that this is a valid area of concern, it really isn't our role. And we just want to make sure that that is out there. Second, in making a peer-reviewed journal, well, second, let's just wait to see some of the results of the poll. And it looks like the majority of people have finished, some people are still taking the poll, but we have a mixed bag. We think that half the people think that this change will lead to more user confusion. And then about a quarter do not believe it will lead to confusion, about a quarter are not sure. So as we, we're gonna consider that, and as we're, the other weight that we're considering is that by making a peer-reviewed journals only flag, we're going to be filtering out all of the high quality work published by IES, the parent organization of ERIC. This work is relevant, readable, and goes through a rigorous peer review process that is more rigorous than many journals. We believe that this information is valuable and want to make sure that it is accessed by as many of our users as possible. Filtering out these documents would also go against the goals set forth in our selection policy. So it's a tough thing for us to balance. So now we're going to summarize the feedback that we've received from users today. And we are, so what we have is that the majority of responses have been overwhelmingly positive. We've heard that while the change will challenge current perceptions about peer reviewed content, it will be beneficial to know if conference papers and reports have been peer reviewed. And that echoes what we've heard today. And we've also heard your concerns about the change, especially those that may cause confusion for students searching peer-reviewed only journal articles. And that's something that we saw echo quite a bit in your poll results. So while we think this is going to be a great change, we realize that there may be unintended consequences such as greater user confusion. Today we'd like to offer you another opportunity to express your thoughts and concerns about ch the changes proposed. We will consider all feedback as we revise the proposed policy. Do you have any thoughts or concerns that haven't been covered so far? Do you agree or disagree with other comments that we've received? Or do you have questions about the policy? If so, please use the chat feature to share your questions and comments to all panelists. And so now we're gonna go through comments that are just submitted. Oh, so next question. Oh. Okay, the uh, question, my major concern with conference papers is that frequently it is the proposal that is reviewed, not the actual paper. I agree that there are times when the final paper is very poorly done. Yes, um, we have also seen those concerns. Um, so we are not interested in peer-reviewed proposals. We are interested in peer-reviewed papers. Um, so a peer-reviewed proposal only is not going to get a peer-reviewed flag in ERIC. That is something that we are not considering. Okay, next comment. If a paper listed in ERIC is not listed as peer-reviewed, does that mean that it is not peer-reviewed or that it is not known is, if it is peer-reviewed? Um, it means that it is not known if it's peer-reviewed because we ask users to submit this information. We're gonna ask publishers to submit this information, um, but it's never possible to have a complete record. And we've seen this for journal articles as well. Um, so this is not really going to be a change. Okay, why don't you consider open peer review? Well, we, 
Do you want to speak to that? Um, we would need a definition. Yeah, so I think we need to hear a little more about what you mean by open peer review. Um, and one thing we will definitely consider, please put your comments in um, so we can talk about it. As we consider review processes, um, one thing is that you normally revise your paper based off of peer review, and some of the open peer review work that I have seen, it's you constantly edit, so we need a version of record. Um, but that is something that if you write in a little more, we'll be happy to talk about a little bit more. Okay, another comment. I already have a lot of concern about the process for journals being really varied. I'm not even more concerned about the gray literature. I'm even more concerned about the process for gray literature. Okay, so we just got back one co a clarification on the open peer review, and that was where, by the definition that the, um, in, that the person wrote, was that it's where the authors know the um, reviewers and the reviewers know the authors. And if you look at our definition of peer review of the ways it will allow, we are not requiring blind peer review. Um, so this could happen um, under the expert peer review where you can't just have Joe Schmo or your mom or your best friend review this. But if it isn't truly an expert, there is times where we need expert peer review um, and you will know the person because there may only be one person who is a good reviewer for that one particular article. And I can think of some examples of that before published by IES. But to get back to the comment raised about the process being varied, yeah, I, as someone who's reviewed all of the journal submissions that go into ERIC, um, as we've reviewed the selection policy, I can say they really are varied. As are the non-journals. I would say that Generally, we do see more variance in the journals than in the non-journals, um, but this is something that there is going to be variance. Um, but we um, and we recognize that concern. Okay. My nagging question is that if, as a librarian and researcher, it is difficult for me to be familiar with conferences and gray literature and their peer review standards, how would Eric staff make this determination? What will be sufficient or adequate proof of peer review? So what we would do is the same process that we use for journals. And that would be that you would have to have a page that outlines what your peer review process is. And that page should be publicly available. There's times where it's not, but we expect it to be publicly available that talks about what this process is. And if it meets the definition on our page, then we accept it. Um, it's important to note that we get that the process is varied, but this will be the same thing as journals. And just to add, um, I think we can expect to find that um, proof either on the website for, say, an association for conference papers, or it sometimes might be right on the on the uh, publication, which is what we've been finding. Okay. Okay. Next comment. If you're going to add these materials, please create a filter so we can filter them out easily. Our students also must use peer-reviewed journals. So this is something that we um, have heard and heard and heard and heard again. And we want to do it, and we want to do it right, but we also have to meet the balance of um, the fact that the peer review policy is policy set forth by IES. And by doing this, we would effectively filter out all of our work. Um, so it is something that we are considering. Something to, that struck us is that the overwhelming majority of users on the call today are not using the free eric.ed.gov. Um, so this is something that you may find in a vendor provider, but we'll, and that's something that we have no control over. Um, and that, that might be a good avenue to try to get that information. Um, but on the public site, we are trying to strike a balance that also meets the priorities of our office um, and our authorizing legislation because we want Eric to continue to exist. And so one of the ways that we have to do this is that we are required to kind of highlight our materials. We could also be in a situation where a student is confident the materials they retrieve are peer-reviewed, whereas their professor insists they are not. 
Yes, that is a real concern. Um, and that is a case where, first of all, it's not the government's job to tell the professors how to teach, um, which I think everybody is probably grateful for. Um, and this is going to challenge some of the ways that people think about peer review. And professors may need to think about how they assign some of their standards. Um, but we do need to be mindful of these documents, like the one we showed from the Australian Education Teacher Association, are peer reviewed. They have the documents. The work published by IES is peer reviewed and is regularly used and regularly cited. Um, so we, ha we don't want to provide inaccurate information to users as well. Why not two ways to limit a search? One for peer reviewed articles and one for peer reviewed literature, journal articles, conference papers, and others? I, okay, um, I think that that is really helpful that you could do that in multiple ways. That would take away some of the simplicity of the design of the website, um, and we are going to run into some data quality issues, um, but that is something that is possible. It is also something that's possible for if the majority of your students that you are teaching use a vendor site. This may be available by a vendor. And this, so when we're trying to balance, we're making all that data publicly available. And we're prioritizing our resources for how to do the updates to the site. If your students aren't going to be using the free site, they could very easily have that button in an EBSCO or a ProQuest. I'm not familiar if they do or don't. Um, but that could be a way that they could access it. We are also exploring ways to put it on our free site while meeting our goals. Um, but when we spend time doing that, that means that we are unable to do some of the other priorities that we get asked about all the time, like adding a link to holdings or um, other interesting fun features that are on their way. Anytime you increase the options for users, you increase the potential for confusion. Nevertheless, this provides valuable options for more sophisticated users. Perhaps this can be addressed by search interfaces designed for different audiences. Yes, and so search interfaces for different audiences, this gives a few things that we've heard about um, over the past few years. One is advanced search. One is different portals, such as as you see on some websites, I am a researcher, I am a student. Um, we have found that people are really, really turned off to role-based navigation, where I am a student, I am a researcher. Um, they, it's surprising how visceral reactions that we heard from this um, when we did some use or something. The other thing is to create the multiple portals. It, Eric is paid for out of taxpayer dollars. So while that's a great idea, that means that we're taking money out of doing other things, like building new records. Um, and making more information available. So I think that is a great idea and something that we can definitely look into. But we want to balance what is the most important thing for users, so getting the data out in a timely session, or is there making ways to enhance the website, keep the website up to date. And we're keeping a list of all these suggestions to try to figure out what we can implement and how. Um, there is a balance that we just want to be mindful of and want to make sure that we're expressing to you. Okay, so here's a request. Uh, can you display slide 18 again at the end of the session? I want to look at the definition of expert review again. Sure. And, yes. and so while we go to slide 18, what this says is expert peer review is content reviewed by internal or external reviewers and the author's identity may or may not be known to the reviewer. And this gets into the comment that we got earlier where there's a paper that I'm thinking of where there's literally only two people in the world that could have written this type of paper. And one was going to be the reviewer and one was going to be the author. It just is, it's a small world. It's a niche field. There's times where you're going to need to know the audience, but you also need an expert to review this. This is different than a technical working group kind of style um, where it is a formal review with comments, but we do think that this is an important kind of process to recognize. Next comment. I support the idea of being able to filter by both type of published uh, by both type of publication and peer review. When I speak to classes, I distinguish between the types of literature they can see and talk about the value of reports and so on. 
Given the, answer, given the users, the option to limit by these categories offers greater flexibility. That's great. Um, and we currently have that option uh, available on the site, so we're happy that you like that. Okay. Are there any other questions? It looks like we have gone through most of them, all of them. So we're going to just hold on for a minute. And while we're waiting to see if there's any other questions or concerns, we also are going to open up the floor to other Eric questions and concerns that are outside the scope of this. So we don't see anything coming in, so we're going to move on. But if something comes up, feel free to add it. And so we're going to go to our final polling question. And what this says is, given what we've discussed, do you now agree with the proposed change? And separate to this, um, and you can answer it in the comments as well if you want to give us more detailed feedback, was this webinar format effective in explaining the proposed change? We are hoping that it's informative um, and greatly appreciate your participation. Well, as of now, it looks like the majority of users, about two-thirds, agree that this, that they agree with the proposed change. However, um, there's still some that don't, and that's great. Um, we'll get more into your work and feedback, and there's about 30% that are unsure, and we expect this. This is something that we are expecting to be a change, but again, we're talking about 100 records, possibly in the course of a year. And to give you a sense of scale, we publish 4,000 records a month. So this is going to be a very, very small portion of our possible collection. So if you think I have questions or think of thoughts after this, please email us at ericrequests at ed.gov. Our next step is to review all of the feedback that we've received, including your comments and questions today and together with the input from the Collections Advisory Group that is meeting in October, we expect that an updated policy will be posted on ERIC in January 2016. We will make that available on our website and announce it via Newsflash and our social media accounts. If you are not on our Newsflash or social media accounts, please email us at ericrequests at ed.gov and we will send you that information. And thank you so much for attending this webinar. Oh, I think we have one last question. Um, nope, that's a comment. All right, so thank you so much for attending this webinar. Please look through the slides in the archive of this webinar to be posted for in a few weeks at erica.ed.gov question mark multimedia or use the multimedia link at the bottom of this Eric homepage. As soon as these are out, um, we will send you all an email to let you know that you have to download these. Thank you.